uh, what happened here? Let me see if we were recording this or if we are. Okay, so let's get started. I want to use one slide, quickly review uh, what we talked about last time. Uh, and that is more circle, right? And principal stress. Okay. What if I have this situation? I have a plate uh, in the two direction. You get the tension there. Someone stretching this way, someone stretching this way. Okay, both X and Y direction. Huh? Oh. Okay, so if we have a plate that has two directions, X and Y direction, in both directions, you have someone stretching there, so you have no more stress. Okay, what if it happened to be, okay, the two directions, two guys are the same strength, so they stretch in the same stress. Okay, so we have sigma X and the sigma Y, both equal to sigma zero, as you can see here. So this will be sigma zero in this direction, sigma zero in this direction. Now, what's a more circle? And on this plane, there's no shear. OK, how do you draw the more circle? OK, let's say sigma 0 equals to 5. Where's the more circle? Where's the center? Where's the center? The C value equals to, what's the C value? It's half of the sigma x plus sigma y, right? So what's that value? Five, so it should be somewhere five here. Where's point A? Sigma x and the tau xy. Where is that point? Five, so it's here. Where's the point B? Is here, so <laughs> your Mohr circle basically is a, it's a point. Diameter, what's the radius? Zero, right? So what's your maximum shear stress then? Zero. So your circle is basically a zero as a, a dot. Okay. So now if you change any direction, let's see if you look at this direction, what's the stress here? What's the normal stress here? in this direction, any angle theta. You wrote, you wrote it around the circle, right? A more circle. That, now, when you moving around the more circle here, what's the value change? Nothing. You, you circle is at one point, right? So therefore, it doesn't matter you change the theta to any direction. The normal stress will be 5. <laughs> and the shear stress will be 0, always. So in any direction, you're going to have a stress. OK, say this direction here, you have a sigma 0 equals 5. And shear 0. So any direction. OK, so in this sense, if you have a equal, what we call this situation equal by axial. OK, actually equal by axial. So when you have two directions, you stretch the same way. Then there won't be any shear in this material. OK, so that's a very special situation. Equal by axial, there's no shear there. All right. OK, but in general, if you have a more circle, if you draw it, right, somewhere here, and then this will be the sigma 1. This will be the sigma 2. In this case, sigma 1 equal to sigma 2. They both equal to 5. At any point here, you're going to have the sigma x1 and the tau x1, y1. That's a point on the Mohr circle. All right, so that's the tau, and this is the sigma. OK, so that's a quick review of what's Mohr circle. We already went over like a four or five 
examples. So I won't continue to go over another one again. And so it's your turn uh, just practice. Right. So today we're going to go over um, a few more theoretical part. That's the concept uh, stuff. Okay. So the first one we want to talk about for stress, what we call environment. Okay. So when you have a, a point, right, in a, a plate, you're going to have sigma x, sigma y, and the tau xy. And now when you rotate your coordinate to a theta direction, you're going to have sigma x1, and you're going to have the tau x1, y1. Right? So you're going to have a normal stress and shear stress. Okay. Now, we want to find out, OK, this uh, keep changing, right? When you have a different theta, this is going to change. We want to find out what's something, the character that's not changing. Okay. One thing we want to do is ask you to look at this two. If you add these two equations together, yeah. OK, when you add these two together, on the left side, what do you get? Sigma x1 plus sigma y1, right? OK, on the right side, what do you get? The top two equations, when you add them together. This term canceled, term canceled, right? So you only left these two terms here. And then half, half, that's the whole thing. So you end up with this equation. And that's a very interesting equation. So that says when you rotate your coordinate from the old x, y to the new x, one, y, one, OK? There's something that's not changing. It's, consist it's a constant. And that we call environment. And we call it actually force environment. Okay. So later on, you will learn the second environment and third environment. It's more like the eigenvalue problem. I think in A1, A we learn eigenvalue. Right? When you have a matrix, you're going to have eigenvalue. And this is actually the first eigenvalue. Okay. So the stress sigma x plus sigma y is a constant when you rotate the coordinate system. All right. And oftentimes, we actually use this relation to find out uh, to solve problems. So that's why I just gave you this concept, what's the first environment, and that's it. So we call the first environment, so it's I1. That's equals sigma x. So for this reason, if you know uh, the stress in original coordinate system, okay, you know one, then you know the other. So you know that the total value should not change. All right. OK, so that's all about stress rotation. Okay. So next, we will talk about uh, some concept again. Okay, that's the Hooke's law. Okay. In uh, chapter one, we talk about Hooke's law, right? Back then, what's a Hooke's law statement? You say when you have a linear elastic material, when you stretch it within the yield limit, your stress and strain they are proportional, right? Remember, we had this uh, curve. So that's the sigma versus strain. And you're going to have this curve. Then this yield, and then go up, and then break. So this point we call yield stress, sigma y. That's basically the limit we use for materials. Right? And then you discount with a certain safety factor. You discount it down. So right, reduce it. OK. But anyway, that basically when you have a material, you stretch it. What we have will be the stress. It's actually here. So the stress, uh, if I can write here, stress is proportional to the strain. Right? That's the Hooke's law. OK. Now, we want to look at the 2D association. Because we talk about in a plate, right, what kind of stress. You can have sigma x, sigma y. What's the Hooke's law? And we want to generalize it. OK. So to do that, let's first look at if you have a Block, you're stretching the x direction. That's what the picture show here. Okay, if you're stretching the x direction, you're going to have this equations. Okay, the first equation. What's the first equation here? That's Hooke's law. Sigma x equals e epsilon x. Right. So that's basically Hooke's law. That's this equation. You add the x direction, and then become this very first equation. Okay. Now, where does the second equation come from? Poisson's ratio. We talk about Poisson's ratio, right? When you stretch in this direction, you're going to have a strain in this direction. We define Poisson's ratio this way. Nu will equal to epsilon in the lateral direction versus the strain in the x direction. 
it is a negative sign because when you stretch it, this direction is going to shrink. So it's a negative value, right? That's the definition of power strong ratio. Now with this one, you can easily get what's epsilon y here. Because epsilon y is supposed to be Poisson's ratio times the epsilon x. And epsilon x is given here. So you plug this in to Poisson's ratio to this equation, right? Then you get this equation in the y direction. OK, now imagine if you use 3D, then you have the z direction. So the z will be uh, similarly, right, Poisson's ratio. We're assuming isotropic material. Remember, we, the basic assumption was linear elastic, isotropic material, small deformation. That's our initial assumption for all this course. All this we've been talking about is linear elastic material, isotropic, and small deformation. Right? That's consistent. OK, so if you stretch in one direction, you're going to have uh, three deformation in three directions. The x direction is going to stretch this much epsilon x. And then the lateral direction, epsilon y, you're going to get this much deformation. And then similarly in the z direction, you're going to have this much deformation. OK. Everyone follow this part? Yeah, we assume isotropic, right? right? So the y, z direction, they're similar. It's like you have a rod right, in this direction, that direction, or it can be a square uh, rod. It's still the two directions we assume the same. Remember, we assume isotropic, I mean, all directions the same. OK, everyone accept this one, based on Hooke's law and Poisson ratio definition. So we get these three equations. OK, if you accept this one, now, if I have another situation, the same block, I apply stress in the y direction. Then I can use this uh, equation again. So I have the second set of equation. Right? Same reason. You're applying load, so you're going to have a deformation here. And that's calculated by the first very first equation. Actually, in this case, it's a second, very second equation. Right? And then the other two directions, that's Poisson's ratio, so you have the other two equations. Okay. Now, if you accept this two individual load, then we say it's a small deformation, linear elastic. So you can use superposition. All the theory are linear within the linear scope. So you can use superposition. So we can add these two together. Then this will be what you get. Right? So you have a block that under sigma x and the sigma y. In this case, what's the deformation? You can add these two together. So you add it, and then you get this equation. All right? And this one we call the Hooke's law, general Hooke's law, for 2D. For 2D, you're going to have sigma x, sigma y, and tau xy. And then the string, you're going to have epsilon x, epsilon y, and the gamma xy. So that's 2D situation. All right? So this one way you write as epsilon x, right, string in term of stress. Of course, this is like a, you can change this one to a matrix expression. Or you can change this equation, you solve for the stress, then you can write uh, other way. So I think I have it here. Okay. So the first one is, basically I summarize the equations we have there. What's epsilon x, epsilon y? Okay. Uh, actually, in this case, right, if you look at this equation here, the three equations, right? The three, this one, three equations. So I just rewrite it, you get this one. Okay. It, everyone agree this is the same thing as from last page? I just put the process there. Move the one re out. Just make it look nicer, right? Easy to remember, actually. Um, so this is the most common format you will see if you look at the, read the other textbook or if you read advanced. Or uh, let's see, elasticity theory or things. This is the type of equations for 2D. Okay. All right. So again, here the G is a shear modulus. It relates to the Young's modulus, right? And constant ratio. Okay. I think. Let me see if I have it. Also, you can express this in terms of stress. Uh, I don't have it here. Uh, if you read the textbook. They actually change this equation to, you can change it to this format. Sigma x equals something. Sigma y, and then the tau xy. 
So you, you can express all this stress in terms of string. Because this is string equation, you can just easily solve it, right? For example, this one can get a G, gamma, X, Y quickly. And the other two, you have to solve it and then write it out. Okay. So, and if you read the textbook, most time they like to use metrics. So what they put it will be, for this equation, they'll put epsilon as a vector equal to, all right, so this will be like a C and then times the stress as a vector. So the epsilon vector means exactly this three thing here. That's a vector. And then this the stress vector is basically sigma x, sigma y, and tau x y. So it's a group three linear equation. You can use metrics to express it. And then this one, if you read the textbook, oftentimes they feel, you know, write this too many things, too complicated. They want to simplify, easy to write. So they will write this way, sigma equal to d times epsilon. So you will see this equation, all right? So this will be express the stress in terms of string. It's also a metric expression. And one good thing about writing this way will be similar for 1D. It's look like the same, right? It just become not a vector, it's just a variable. Or it can be 3D, because then 3D, this is still a vector, this is still a vector. So you can actually extend to 3D. Right. So for 3D, if we write it out, actually, this is the full equation. Right. So that's the equation, actually. In 3D, you have epsilon. Now you have six component, and that equals to the C matrix, and then times this stress vector. Okay, so for the, in this class here, okay, uh, we won't require you to use the 3D to calculations. Uh, but you need to know, you understand what this one talking about. So this one, you just add the third di direction. Same way, right? You add them together, superposition, add together. <coughs> right? But for the homework problems, uh, most of them will just limit to the 2D association. So we'll use the simplified, this one. Uh, but the concept is the same, okay? The general statement is always, Okay, stress will be proportional to strain. Okay, that proportional can be just a Young's modulus, or can be a C matrix there, or can be a D matrix there. That's all proportional. Okay. So Hooke's law can be generalized to 2D or 3D. We say stress is proportional to stress. So that's basically this linear relation. Okay. And that's the Hooke's law, or generalized Hooke's law. Okay, so that's one concept uh, actually we use a lot because later on when you do analysis, it's not always just like a cable, 1D. It can be a plate or it can be a wall. You oftentimes you need a 2D, and so that's a right? Or even in general, for a complicated structure, you need 3D. So Hooke's law can still be used as long as it's small deformation. And actually, later on, it can be material that's not isotropic. So you can have this one, right? But the three directions can be different. Then you have E1, E2, E3. Mu1, the, the Poisson ratio can be mu1, mu2, mu3. Because for lots of things, they are not isotropic. A typical example is wood, right? If you wood, there are fibers there, or muscle. You have fiber there. So the muscle or wood, when you compress this way, or you pull this way, uh, the mechanical property, the Young's modulus. It will be different, right? So you can have <laughs> isotropic situation. The three direction, the material constant, all are different. And then later on, even complicate, then everything becomes now linear. So you don't have this linear relation anymore. Don't have the hook law anymore. So the stress will relate to strain, but in a now linear way, especially like a muscle. So oftentimes we, for bone, we actually use linear. We can treat, use a linear model to do analysis. But for muscle, there will be very non-linear curve. It's actually some kind of exponential type of curve. And so that's even more complicated. Okay. But that's all just for your information for fun. We won't, it's all, you know, we won't cover here. Uh, won't be any questions related to that. Okay. Um, so I just let you know this on uh, later on when you take other courses, you know, oh I heard it's not linear. So it'll be easy for you to learn the new thing.
All right, any questions about the uh, Hooke's Law? All right, so again, see here's concept. So I can uh, give you a quiz really to all this concept. Uh, we actually, we're going to have one more quiz uh, that's coming up. All right. We had, uh, I think we had seven quizzes so far. Uh, total we have eight. So there will be another quiz coming up that's more you know, concept uh, type of question. Mm -hmm. All right. All right. OK, here's another quick concept. Um, just tell you, OK, when you have a string in three directions, now if you add all the string together, it's actually equal to the volume change. And the reason is actually very simple. If you look at this, this is actually the whole derivation process, right? Because initially you have an object, let's say A, B, C, three dimension, three direction lengths. And then when you have a string, you stretch it, get longer, right? So direction you have epsilon x, epsilon y, and epsilon z. And now the new volume will be the one listed here. So this will be the new A. This will be the new B, deformed B. And this will be the deformed C. So the volume will be A, B, C, new A, new B, new C, multiplied together. And now if you divide this two, you get this relation. And that is volume change. Okay. All right. So next we're going to talk about string. All right. But before that, I just want to let you know this epsilon x plus epsilon y, epsilon z, that's another invariant. That's when you change the x direction. That summation is a constant. Don't change this direction. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, so your epsilon x plus epsilon y plus epsilon z, that's a now dimension now percent volume change. It can be deduction or increase. Inflation, right? All right. Okay, that's just a quick. Uh, all right, so in 3D situation, um, here is a more circle look like. So you're going to have three circles together for 3D situation. That's why we don't go to the 3D. We just talk about 2D. 2D is easier. You just have a more circle there. In 3D, you can actually draw three uh, circles. All right, so that's just for your information for fun. You don't, you don't, need, you don't uh, have any question to cover that. Okay. But the one concept we're going to need to cover is the concept of plane strain. All right. So far, we talked about play, uh, plate, right? So that's basically a thin plate. And we say that's plane stress. So the stress all in this plane, in the z direction, in the thickness direction, there is no stress. That's what we talked about so far. OK. The next special situation we want to talk about is called plane strain. OK, in this situation, the character is, OK, you're going to have stress in the z direction, but you don't have strain in the z direction. OK, how can that happen? OK, here are a few examples. What's the situation that can happen? All right, the first example is this wall for this uh, dam there. OK, if you look at this dam, right, so the dam is you build it there, right? between two mountains and to hold the water there. So if you just look at this dam there, it's under pressure load from the water, right? So if you look at the in inside, the water pressure compression actually I show here, this cross-section view. This is the cross-section view. So you have water pressure, of course, it's very low in the top and then very high in the bottom because pressure change. Right? But on this side, it's pretty much free here. Okay. So if you cut the cross section this way, then this is a loading situation. Okay. So the pressure is pushing within this plane. However, if you look at the z direction, okay, if you look at perpendicular to this plane, to the screen, okay, in this direction, what's the situation? Is there stress there? And the answer is yes. Right? Because, because it's not free. The, the, the dam is all cross from this mountain to this mountain. OK, so what's the zero? The zero is this dam is between two mountains or two rigid wall. Cannot explain. 
So when the water pressure on it, the other direction, Poisson's effect, supposed to be stretch or extend, right? Because of Poisson ratio. But in this case, you're building between two rigid walls, there's no deformation in this direction. And so, in other words, your epsilon in the z direction will equal zero. And that's the plane strain situation. Yes? The bottom picture. The bottom picture, I'm trying to draw this channel here. The canal. Yeah, but the is also curved. I'm talking about the perfect situation. You have a straight wall there. Yeah, the curved one, there will be some other issues. So it won't be plain uh, strain. Because I got a picture of curved wall, right? But I'm talking about actually straight wall. OK. So I'll change it next time. We'll find a better picture. Or if you guys have a better picture, email me. I can use next time. All right? The forces of the structure, basically. For the canal, For the canal say here. OK. This terminal here, you're, what you have is, let's say inside, you may have a little bit of air pressure. But from the outside, it's a mountain. Right? The weight of the mountain. So you have the compression from outside, all the direction, right? All the, I mean, all the pressure, all the weight, OK? But now if you cut a cross section, so your load will be from external or it can be internal. They're all within this plane, the load you can see in this direction, OK? However, because this is a long tunnel, so if you look at the, you, if you imagine you stand in the middle of this <coughs> tunnel there, OK, so when the load is applying there, this thing you cannot push away, or you can, or cannot just compress it. So the lens pretty much fixed there. And therefore, if you look at the particle, a break, let's say you have a break there, or a block of stone inside there. So the condition will be the stress from this, within this cross-sectional plane. But the within, in this direction, the z direction, the break cannot expand or shrink. So the epsilon z will be zero. Now, in this direction, no strain. So we call it plane strain. So the definition for plane strain is really simple. Epsilon z equals zero. If you call this z direction. Of course, it can be epsilon x equals zero if you call this x direction. But it's, anyway, it's the third dimension. There's no uh, strain in that direction. So that's what we call plane strain. OK. So those are just a picture of uh, possible situations. OK, so here is the definition of what's a plane strain. So in the z direction, there's no strain. And also, everything there, you can cut a plane, they're all the same. So there's no twist in this direction. So the gamma raised to z all equals 0. So what you have will be, you only have three components here. You're going to have epsilon in x direction, there are stretch. The y direction, there are stretch. And then this twist in the x or y direction. That's a plain strain situation. Okay. The reason we talk about this because this happens in the real world, and oftentimes we can use plain strain as a model, simplify the analysis, so we don't have to do 3D analysis. Change the question to 2D. Right. And we reduce to the three component. Okay. But this one, if you look at it, remember what's a plain stress? You have sigma x, sigma y, tau xy. So it's very similar, right? Parallel. You have stress, plane stress, you have three stress component. Now plane strain, you have three strain component. Okay. Very parallel, similar. Now, question comes to be saying, what if you rotate the axis? Right? When you rotate in into a direction, arbitrary direction, you're going to have um, the same issue, the different strain. So we're going to have similarly how the strain get rotated, and also how, actually, let me go back here, how the uh, string component change. You're going to have a more circle about the string. Right. OK, so first, a few, I uh, have these two slides, just really clarify what a comparison between the plane stress and plane strain. Okay. So plane stress is sigma z equals 0. Plane strain will be epsilon z equals 0. So that's the main character of plane stress versus plane strain. Uh, 
Okay, here in more detailed comparison. This is a table from the textbook, actually. So it's in the textbook. You can just read it. Uh, so that's more detailed one. But to characterize, easy for you to memorize, is this two things. Plane stress, no stress in the third direction. Plane strain, no strain in the third direction. Okay, so uh, as I just mentioned, when you have this coordinate system rotating, what's the new strain component when you have a different observation direction? Okay, so you can look at this picture here. It's actually try to use geometry to explain uh, what's a new one, what's a new strain component. Okay, let's just look at the one. Uh, I won't derive the equation, but I want to explain how they derive the equation. Okay, so I gave a quick explanation. Okay, here, let's say I want to find what's the new epsilon x1 in this uh, uh, x1 direction. Initially, it's this x and this is the y. Okay, I want to find the strain in this x1 direction. Okay, how can I find it? I want to find it, how it's affected by the original uh, strain. Okay, let's say because I know there will be epsilon x, right? So from epsilon x, so this block going to stretch to deform to here, to this dotted line. When this happens, the epsilon x, this is because of epsilon x, right? So the epsilon x is going to cause this diagonal direction line change a little bit. So that contributes to my epsilon x1. So I can calculate how much length changes here. And then if you have a epsilon y, so this is epsilon y, that causes diagonal line change a little bit as well. So I can calculate how much this line it's changed, right? And also, if there's shear strain, so gamma x y, then because this element deformed into this shape, so I can ca also calculate how much actually show here. This line changed. Now, what's the final total line change in that x y direction? Should be all three together, right? So I add all the three. I count it here, count it here, and then I count it here. Add all three together. That's the strain in this x1 direction. That's how I calculate. So that's the idea. Okay, so the detailed derivation is shown here. So you can actually read the textbook. That's the same thing. Right. So it's basically the idea is you get the first part because epsilon x, the second part because epsilon y, second, third part because of gamma xy. Add them together, then you calculate, okay, this is how much length change. Then initial length is this much. So you get the strain. Similarly, you can get epsilon y and the gamma x in the new direction, right? Okay, so I want to just give you this idea, not the mathematical derivation, but that you can read it later, all right? So because that, we have this equation. So if I do all this epsilon x, epsilon y, and the gamma, so I'm going to have these three equations here. And in fact, I put this in the red block here. That's the final equation. Okay, so this looks very familiar, right? As a stress equation, so it's actually very similar. How similar it is? If you change, okay, here, if you change sigma x to epsilon x, change tau to half of the gamma, those two equations basically the same. So you can get them from stress to strain or strain to stress. The equation looks like the same. You just replace sigma and the epsilon. Replace tau and the gamma, and the equation is pretty much the same. And for this reason, we know there will be a, must be a circle. And so therefore, you have a more circle for strain. Okay. So now another job. We need to, when I give you a strain, you need to draw a more circle for strain, right? And then you need to be able to use that to determine the principal strain, maximum shear strain, and the principal direction. Similar, right? It's the same way. But if you can do the more circle for stress, right? The more circle for strain, they are very parallel, similar. Right? So when we draw the more circle for strain, okay? So we actually draw this way. So here is the epsilon x. Here is the half of the gamma x. Why you put the half there? Because we know. See, here's a relation. If you replace the half gamma with uh, tau, it's actually the same. So if I do this way, I will get a perfect circle. All right. 
So all this notation is the same. So here is your first principal strain. Here is your second principal strain. The radius is your maximum shear strain. So all the same. All right. Okay, now can you draw more circle for strain? If I give you the component in the original x or y direction. Yeah, similar, right? You just change it to this uh, number. The only difference is here. The circle, I mean, the coordinate here is half the uh, gamma x1. All right, any questions? Okay, I think I have an example here next, yeah. So there's one uh, very useful application based on this theory. Okay, so this theory here, more circle, all this equation, these equations. Okay, a very useful application is for us to measure strain. Okay, so the way we can measure strain, uh, I don't know, some of you take a material lab, right? In a material lab, do you measure strain deformation? Okay. How do you measure strain? Use a strain gauge, what we call it. So what's a strain gauge? It's basically you have a, a piece, right, very thin piece. In that piece, inside, embedded inside, is a, just the metal wire, very thin. So the wire go back and forth, and then you lay it on a piece of paper. And then you stick to the surface of an object you want to measure strain. And that's called strain gauge. Okay, the principle is very simple. Because when you have these wires I show here, this is the one we call one string gauge here. When you look at all this wire there, okay, let's say you are deforming this object. Let's say you are stretching. So when you stretch, you stretch the metal wire as well because they are very thin. So they will just follow the, the surface to deform, right? So when you, the sur surface is stretched, then this wire gets stretched. Okay, what happens when you stretch the wire? They get thinner, right? The diameter reduces. So there are resistance change. So therefore, I can use a device, electric device, uh, called bridge device. You can measure how much resistance change of in this uh, gauge. And that I can actually calibrate. And I know, OK, this much for this uh, gauge, OK, this much of the resistance change corresponding to how much stretch, how much strain. That's how you can measure strain. So immediately, OK, if you put a Gauge in this y direction, okay, this one can give you epsilon y, you can measure it. And then if you put it in the x direction, it can give you in the epsilon x from the reading, right? But if you put it in this arbitrary x direction, this will give you strain in the, in the x1 direction. So you can put as many you want. You can measure any direction. OK, now the question is, in a plate, normally you're going to have normal sigma x, sigma y, or epsilon x, epsilon y. But you also have a shear, right? You have a tau xy or gamma xy. How can you measure that? Shear deformation, the twist. And we actually don't have a good device to measure. So the way they can measure it is use this, call this, um, Rule set of the string gauge. So you can form a pattern, use multiple string gauge, as shown here, use three. So you measure this one, let's say in 45 degree. So you measure this string. Because the metal wire all align this way, right? So you can measure the stretch in this direction. Okay, now you can use these three measurements. They give you three val value, right? This three. So this directly, you know epsilon x. This is, you know epsilon y. And this one gives you, let's say, epsilon 45 degree. Now, use this three value. You can put it back to this equation. Find out the gamma. OK. How can we find it? Use the, the equations we already have here. We have three equations. Do we know epsilon x1? Let's say we have 45 degree. Change the theta to 45 degree. OK, do you know epsilon x1? Yes, that's a string gauge reading, right? OK, do you know epsilon x? 
Yes? Yeah, that's one uh, gauge give you, right? And then do you know epsilon y? Yeah, you from another the second string gauge. Now, do you, you know theta, right? OK, what's the unknown here? The comma is the only unknown. So therefore, if you plug epsilon x1 here, then you can use this equation, find out the gamma x1. And that's how we can measure the shear strain. And that's why this way, you know, you combine string gauge can help you measure the strain. Because you now you know epsilon x, epsilon y, and the gamma x y. You can all measure through the three gauge composition. Right? And there are other ways. You can put a string gauge this way. There are other ones. You can put a string gauge. So this is one gauge. You can put another gauge this way, another gauge this way. So you have three reading. That can also give you the value. Right? Or you can put it this way. So like this one here, you put the x this way, the y this way, and then you put another one this way. That can. So it doesn't matter. You just, as long as three, you have three direction reading, you can get all the three components. And I think the textbook describes a little bit about you know, different uh, way of orienting the third string gauge. There. OK, I didn't finish this example. So read the textbook. I think it's in the textbook. Read it through it. Make sure you understand, follow how they actually get the values. All right. Any questions? Yes. The third exam, uh, it's on the syllabus. I think it's uh, one week from the coming Monday. It's uh, the 20th, right? Yeah. It will be including uh, the deflection. That's chapter 9. Then in detail on the beam, chapter 10. And then the, this chapter 7. 7, 9, 10. And I'll let you know the day, OK, the content will stop here. OK, the content will be new, won't be covering in the exam three. I'll let you know.